Hi, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Um, before we get started, just the usual reminders for me, please make sure to stay muted and make sure on. If you have questions or comments at any time, you can add them into the chat box. Chat with everyone at the bottom of your screen, and we will share them during the Q&A. You'll be getting an evaluation by email in the next day or two. Please fill that out for us. It helps us with future Grand Rounds planning. And um, a reminder of the closed captioning feature that is available at the bottom of the screen. If you're having a hard time hearing, you can turn that on and you can read what's being said. Um, and finally, a disclosure from the planners of Grand Rounds. We have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. And with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Erin Whiteman, who will introduce our fabulous speakers for the day and be in charge from here. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Mazur, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, again, my name is Aaron Whiteman, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's Ethics Grand Rounds and introducing our two speakers. Before I do that, I want to begin by acknowledging that Ethics Grand Rounds is sponsored by the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics and is supported by a fund established by Jeff Sconiers and Deborah Godfrey. We're grateful for their support. I would also like to briefly remind everyone about the format of Ethics Grand Rounds, as it's slightly different than our typical Grand Rounds. Ethics Grand Rounds is meant to be a case-based consideration of an ethical issue in pediatrics. The cases presented are inspired by actual events, but are modified and intended mainly as a starting place to consider the issues raised. I'm thrilled to introduce our two speakers today. The case will be presented by Dr. Brittany Lee, who I'll introduce shortly, and she'll be followed uh, by a commentary by our invited speaker, Dr. Yolanda Wilson. After the commentary, we'd like to stimulate discussion, and I invite you to enter questions or comments into the chat, which I will be monitoring. So now on to introductions. Today, our case presenter and first speaker will be Dr. Brittany Lee. As I said, she'll be followed by our case commentator, Dr. Yolanda Wilson from St. Louis University. I'll introduce Dr. Lee now and Dr. Wilson after the case. Dr. Brittany Lee is a pediatrician and current pediatric fellow in clinical bioethics and hematology oncology at the University of Washington and Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics. Without further delay, I'll hand things over to Dr. Lee and, and we'll get started. Thanks, Dr. Whiteman. Sharing. Great. And so for Dr. Whiteman and myself, we don't have any uh, significant financial disclosures. We'll begin with our case. Keon is an 18 year old who has severe beta thalassemia. He's been cared for at the pediatric center for most of his life. He's been reliant on regular blood transfusions every couple of weeks, as well as iron chelation therapy since infancy. The hematology team has consulted bioethics to ask for guidance on addressing refusal or non-adherence with treatments. Increasingly, Keon has been missing transfusion appointments or asking that his transfusions be skipped. His reasons for missing appointments usually are related to missing his ride to the hospital or not feeling up to it. There's also a concern that Keon has not been adherent <clears throat> with his <clears throat> Excuse me. That Keon hasn't been adherent with his oral chelation therapy. The hematology team is concerned about these mistreatments as they greatly increase his risk for severe complications. These include things such as bone fractures, liver failure, and even death. And for Keon, have resulted in a few hospitalizations for emergent or urgent treatment. There have been efforts made to arrange rides as well as other supports, but unfortunately, these have had limited success. A little more about Keon. He identifies as African American. He was a ward of the state for most of his life. Neither his parents nor any other biological relatives are currently involved in his life. He did live with a foster family for several years, but this relationship has been terminated. That was before Keon turned 18. For the past few years, Kian's experienced significant poverty as well as food and housing insecurity. He's been living on friends' couches. Due in part to his chronic disease, Kian has received limited schooling. He had a psychometric evaluation performed when he was a minor, which showed that Kian has a moderate 
intellectual disability. Despite this lack of resources or lack of support, Kian has also demonstrated significant strengths in his relationship building and ingenuity, as well as resourcefulness in getting his needs met. When he's asked, Kian is clear that he wants to continue to live and that he would like to receive a bone marrow transplant. He shares long-term goals with his team of having a job, living independently, as well as obtaining a driver's license. He's not currently a bone marrow transplant candidate. This is due to long-term complications of non-adherence with his medications, as well as a lack of social supports. He does desire to remain within the pediatric program who really has provided care to him and treatment to him for most of his life. While he does show cognitive limitations, he's able to share reasoning and thought processes consistent with competence. In light of all of these concerns, his primary team has considered several options. Admitting Keon indefinitely until a more stable housing situation can be found, respecting Keon's refusal or not adherence of blood transfusion treatment, seeking adult protective services involvement to help Keon obtain guardianship, or forcing transfer to an adult hematology program. This case has really caused considerable distress among team members, especially concern about complicity in contributing to Keon's possible death or further complications, or concern of overruling his agency. Others are worried about the potential of both implicit and explicit biases that may be impacting decision making regarding Keon and his care. So to address the team's question, an initial ethics approach might be to assess for competence, as I mentioned earlier. There really are well established and published criteria to assess competence of a patient in order to provide consent for a particular decision. To demonstrate capacity, a patient must be able to do the following. Clearly indicate the preferred treatment option, understand the relevant information that's communicated by the medical team, acknowledge their medical condition and the likely consequences of the treatment options, as well as to reason about the treatment options. So in this case, Kian does appear to have competence to make decisions about blood transfusion. Adults, even those with intellectual disabilities, who exhibit competence are able to make medical decisions. Traditionally, this might actually be the end of an ethics council. However, recognition that Kian may be competent to make decisions about blood transfusions really does not su sufficiently address the concerns of the team, nor of Kian, nor does it provide guidance about what obligations, roles, or efforts the team should provide in Kian's care. In this case, this traditional ethics approach is inadequate. There's more to the council. So with this in mind, we ask whether considering a framework of intersectionality might provide another ethical perspective. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, our commentator on the issues raised by this case today is Dr. Yolanda Wilson. Dr. Wilson is an Associate Professor of Healthcare Ethics in the Gennady Center for Healthcare Ethics at St. Louis University, uh, where she holds additional appointments in the Departments of Philosophy and African American Studies. She's a 2019-2020 Fellow at the National Humanities Center and Encore Public Voices Fellow, and is currently working on a monograph, Black Death, Racial Justice, Priority Setting, and Care at the End of Life. Dr. Wilson is a widely recognized scholar on issues at the intersection of bioethics, race, and gender. Uh, Professor Wilson has shared that she believes that the philosophic endeavor is enriched when diverse voices are at the table, and she's committed to broadening that discipline. I share that commitment, but additionally, I'll share that, that as a clinical bioethicist, my own clinical work and scholarly efforts have been enriched by Dr. Wilson's scholarship and voice, and I'm thrilled that we have the opportunity to learn from her today. So with that, I'll, I'll hand things over to Dr. Wilson. Dr. Lightman, I swear I'm blushing. You caught me off guard. I wasn't expecting that. Oh, let me start my um, timer so that I don't um, prattle on too much. Thank you all so much for having me here today. I am just thrilled and 
I'm also really nervous. I get so nervous when I get in a room with clinicians. You all make me so anxious, um, even though you always turn out to be lovely, lovely folks. But yeah, the clinicians make me nervous. So I'm hoping that um, you'll find some of my comments useful or at the very least uh, that we can provoke further conversation. So I'm actually a philosopher by trade, by training. And so um, I remember when I was an undergraduate philosophy major, my mother came to my class once and she goes, do y'all ever have an answer for anything? And so I had to say, you know, often we don't. And so I have to kind of give you the heads up today. You might not get answers uh, just, just to set the expectation at a reasonable place. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. I'm hoping you can see, yeah, that's the screen that I want to share. All right, and of course, I have to start with the disclosure um, that I don't have any kind of financial interests or relationships to dis to claim or uh, no products. And uh, so here we are. This is this is the beginning. Uh, intersectionality as a conceptual framework in clinical pediatrics and bioethics. So I, I must say that when I got this call, and particularly about this case, so I, I don't have much experience in pediatrics and thinking about pediatric kind of cases. And so I was really surprised that there are young adults who still kind of seek out pediatric care or who are, are committed to kind of staying with their, their clinicians from childhood. And so um, I knew that as a college professor that I had a few students uh, who are undergraduates who might still go to their pediatrician, but I didn't realize it, it happens a bit more commonly than I expected. So seeing this case has been quite a learning experience for me for that reason also. But I want to kind of think about, I'm going to start with the question that Dr. Lee left, left us with or left her part of the case with. And that is, can considering a framework of intersectionality provide another ethical perspective? And I want to say the answer to that is it depends. It depends on what one thinks intersectionality can do and um, also how expansively one thinks about ethics. And I say that because as a methodology, as a theoretical framework, as a conceptual framework, intersectionality is not and has not historically been thought of as a, a kind of ethics guiding framework. And we can talk about that in a, in a second. But I, I think that there is space for kind of fruitful learning there. And so I've actually written on um, intersectionality as forming the basis of a conceptual framework that then could be ethics guiding. And so, although you may not get the kind of hard and fast answers that some of you may have come looking for, I think that there, again, is space to be fruitful here. All right, so what are the objectives? Let's just kind of reiterate the objectives. Recognize how intersecting aspects of a patient's identity may impact the care they receive, and identify the bioethical issues that arise in the care of an adult patient in a pediatric institution. Now, I'm sure that you all will have a lot to contribute to this second objective, even, even as that is our objective of the day. I want us to think about this space as a collaborative learning space, as even as I am the primary commentator here. And so certainly in the time that we have for questions and conversations, I hope that we can kind of think about that. And actually, I think at the end of my talk, I'll leave us with one or two questions that might actually frame how we think about adult care in pediatric institutions and also what that means, right? What that potentially means um, that there are adult patients in pediatric institutions. I've been thinking about this question ever since I got this case. And so I'm, I'm quite interested in, in some of the answers. All right, so what is going to be the overview? I, I like to walk my audience through things, partly for them so that they'll have a sense of where this is going, but also for me, because I know that there are times that I just get really excited and just start talking. And so this kind of keeps me on track. So what I really want to do for maybe even the bulk of my comments is to just really dig into intersectionality as a concept. 
And I want to do that because I know that although there's been significant uptake in the last 10, 15 years or so of thinking about intersectionality in healthcare spaces, that, you know, it doesn't quite have the hold that it has in for us over on the humanities and social sciences side of things. And so there may be people in the room who don't quite have a firm handle on conceptually what intersectionality is. And furthermore, you know, if you spend any time on social media or in the kind of conversations that I find myself in, I think sometimes uh, we we throw around words and there's not a lot of either conceptual clarity, uh, not a lot of people actually reading and thinking. And so terms get muddled or they start kind of losing any and all meaning. And so I want us to spend a good amount of time today just getting clear about what intersectionality is. And then I want us to talk about intersectionality and its relevance to healthcare. And I say, especially in pediatrics, because of course we're in a space, we're in a pediatric space, but I want us to kind of, of course, hang on to that in the background, but but I want to think broadly about intersectionality and its, and its um, relevance to healthcare. And then of course, like I said, I do have a couple of points of discussion or questions that I'm curious about how you all in the audience think, right? So this is going to be fairly participatory at the end, but I'm I'm kind of curious about how you're thinking about these things in light of some of the things that I'm thinking about. I want to say a few words about bias because that comes in, you know, of course it came into Dr. Lee's presentation of the case where the team was very was concerned, right? Are are we expressing bias, uh, even bias that may be implicit, bias of about which we may not be consciously aware toward Keon in such a way that is negatively impacting the care that he's receiving or that is negatively impacting our ideas about the care that he should receive as a patient. And, you know, I must say that I'm actually quite heartened that this is even a conversation in the space that your team um, that your team is having that conversation in this space because I you know I I have been in spaces uh, as someone who does race work and gender work where um, how can I say nicely and still accurately that there's resistance uh, sometimes to even thinking about. Um, to even raising the possibility of bias, right? That so so that there becomes resistance. So the fact that Keon's team can sit in a room and kind of raise that independently and kind of think, you know, are we expressing bias in some way or another? Uh, I, I already think that you're ahead of the game, uh, or certainly ahead of some of the spaces that I've been in. And uh, so, where does bias even come into the story about intersectionality? Well. You know, there's a, there's been a lot of work in the last 20 years about implicit bias and whether we're actually aware of the attitudes that we may hold against others as individuals or against some groups of others. And I think that that's potentially useful. I also think that uh, some of the implicit bias conversation can sometimes let us off the hook because we think, oh, well, if I'm not aware of this or if I can't quite help it, or if I'm not doing this intentionally, then that may be the end of the story, right? I don't have to do any further work. And one thing that I think that the concept of intersectionality raises is, you know, just inherently, independently, an idea about struggling against forms of oppression and bias becomes one way that that manifests. Now, Another important point here is that our biases aren't freestanding, right? We don't just have biases that just kind of float around in a vacuum somewhere that aren't affected by any other thing, that aren't affected by the attitudes of others, that aren't affected by how we were raised or where we live or what our political commitments are or our own identities. And so you know, in order to really understand the fruitfulness of intersectionality, 
one also has to understand that intersectionality is is a conceptual framework that's deep, that's situated, right? It's rooted in something. It's not, as much as I love being a philosopher and love doing theory, right? This idea of intersectionality is that it's it's committed to something, right? It's, it's inherently um, understanding of, appreciative of how we actually operate in the world, right? So there's an element, although I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not sure Crenshaw would, use this exact language, but there is an element of phenomenology, right? Of how we kind of experience phenomena that we encounter in the world. And our biases, the ones that we hold and the ones that we experience from others, often manifest simultaneously with other forms of oppression. And that's going to be kind of the linchpin of intersectionality. The idea that, right, we don't have kind of abstract persona that we come into the world with, right? That I'm not just a woman in some abstract sense or just a Black person in some abstract sense. That these forms of identity that make me who I am, these kind of constitutive aspects of who I am are interwoven. And so whatever biases I may hold or whatever biases I experience often um, manifest as this interwovenness. And that brings us directly to the concept of intersectionality. We can talk a little bit more about bias in the um, Q&A if you're interested. Crenshaw doesn't spend a ton of energy in her initial work on intersectionality, talking about bias in this kind of individualistic um, sense. That's not the language that she uses, but she does talk about like discrimination and oppression, and, and and I'm gonna come to Crenshaw in a second. For those of you who are going, who is Crenshaw, and why is she why is she talking about Crenshaw? So the the term is coined by legal theorist Kimberly Crenshaw, and we're, and we're gonna actually have some of her work on the screen in a second. So I'll I'll come to that in a second. The underlying idea, and this actually comes from a paper on intersectionality that I co-authored a few years ago that the traditional single axis analyses of race and gender have focused on the most privileged members of the group in strategizing how to ameliorate oppression. What do I mean by that? Well, a single axis analysis of race or a single, a single axis analysis of gender is an analysis um, that thinks of race as singular to one's identity or that thinks of gender as singular to one's identity and not a component among other components of one's identity. So early analyses, for example, that make the case for racial justice um, tended to focus on the experience of men who were members of the race. Likewise, kind of analyses, and, and, and Crenshaw's writing in a US context, and so the idea of intersectionality is kind of at least in terms of its genealogical roots, intellectual genealogy is thinking about a US context. So, so these kind of early analyses of gender, of gender oppression, focus on white women, namely middle-class white women, and I would say race similarly, middle-class black men. And so for Crenshaw, the idea, and, and you know, again, she is my, um, I don't want to say the intellectual mother of intersectionality because that's not quite accurate, although she coins the term. But uh, her work is heavily influential on my own and, and my own thinking about this. But to focus on the most privileged members in strategizing how to ameliorate oppression means thinking about, for instance, um, equal pay policies that white women have historically advocated for. Um, without really thinking about the other kinds of institutional barriers to education and work that women of color have historically faced. And so intersectionality is both a response to these kinds of oversight and also a kind of push for engaging along multiple axes in order to think about how do we make life better for everyone? Okay, so now we come to Kimberly Crenshaw. 
Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. She is a legal theorist. For the longest time, she had joint appointments at Columbia and UCLA, which I was always fascinated about how she pulled that off, how she made that work. But she's a legal theorist. And the, the kind of groundbreaking paper that she wrote came out in 1989, demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine, feminist theory, and anti-racist politics. So that title is quite a mouthful, admittedly. But I think it I think it captures what she's trying to do. And again, she's writing as a legal theorist. So the other part that's kind of interesting about intersectionality and how it's taken hold is that now we're sitting here in pediatric grand rounds thinking about intersectionality, not just from a kind of legal employment standpoint, which is um, what she was doing in this initial paper, but also thinking like, how do we think about patient care from this lens, from this framework? How do we think about our role as, as providers, as clinicians, as caregivers, from this standpoint. And so, you know, this work has just been amazingly generative across disciplines. Here's kind of the crux of, of kind of the early work, right? And, and how we get to the term intersectionality. And, and what I wanna just kind of flag for our kind of intellectual pleasure that, you know, people can go back and investigate later on if they're interested, or we can talk about it a little bit um, in the Q&A if you're interested. You know, as I said, Crenshaw's, Crenshaw coins the term intersectionality, but this idea of framing aspects of one's identity and thinking about how those aspects, of, how those various aspects of one's identity converge to in, into their own kind of unique forms of oppression or can conform, can converge into their own unique um, forms of oppression is not a new idea, right? I mean, we can travel back at least to the 18th century, uh, 19th century, and see those kinds of conversations happening, interestingly enough, also among Black women writers and thinkers. And, you know, the famous Sojourner Truth uh, excerpt, uh, Anti a Woman, is, is an example of that, right? Where she's kind of critiquing white women for, um, advocating for suffrage and and the kind of responses around white women and delicacy and she's saying look i i'm not treated in these delicate ways and and aren't i also a woman so you know we can we can kind of travel back and even before truth um to mariah stewart in 1832 right so these kinds of conversations were happening being written about being thought through but in terms of kind of contemporary work, I think a lot of people set Crenshaw as, as the person who coins the term intersectionality, and she, and she did, right? So Crenshaw says, consider an analogy to traffic in an intersection, coming and going in all four directions. Discrimination like traffic through an intersection may flow in one direction and it may flow in another. If an accident happens in an intersection, it can be caused by cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. Sometimes I... Um, italicize this part, right? So if one is experiencing discrimination, and again, this piece in particular, this early piece, is specifically about discrimination law. If one is experiencing discrimination, it's not necessarily the case that one is just experiencing discrimination as a woman or as a, an older person or as, right? That, that sometimes it may be that one is experiencing discrimination in one way or along one aspect of one's identity. And sometimes one may be experiencing discrimination among multiple aspects of one's identity. And she's thinking again about, she's using the language of discrimination because she's specifically writing about anti-discrimination law. Right, and here she goes again later in the same paper. To bring this back to a non-metaphorical level, I am suggesting that Black women can experience discrimination in ways that are both similar to and different from those experienced by white women and Black men. And so Crenshaw is initially writing about Black women. She doesn't restrict the, the domain of thinking about intersectionality or the con conceptual framework of intersectionality to Black women, but that is kind of the category of people who she has in mind initially, and there's a reason for that, not just because she's a black woman. I think sometimes people reduce intersectionality to kind of what I like to call diary studies from people just writing in their diary. But no, there, there's a reason for that and we'll get to that in a second. So uh, Crenshaw continues, black women sometimes experience discrimination in ways similar to white women's experience. 
sometimes they share very, very similar experiences with black men. Yet they often experience double discrimination, the combined effects of practices which discriminate on the basis of race and on the basis of sex. And sometimes they experience discrimination as black women, not the sum of race and sex discrimination, but as black women, right? That becomes a, a thing. And the analogy that I came up with, and I need to write about this because I've said it enough times, I feel like somebody's gonna write about this and, and not mention it, that I, I'll say sometimes that intersectionality is describing orange, right? If you mix red and yellow, you don't get like red, like you don't get some shade of red, you get orange. And and the shade of orange may depend on how much red and how much yellow you mix, but it's a, it becomes its own new thing. And that's what Crenshaw is trying to suggest, that sometimes discrimination might look like red and sometimes discrimination might look like yellow. But if you add red and yellow, you don't just get red plus yellow, you get a new thing, you get a specific thing. Um, and so that's what she means when she says, you know, that sometimes black women experience discrimination as black women, right? That it's not just additive. You're not just kind of come along and checking boxes and adding all the ways that one imagines oneself to be disadvantaged. But more importantly, or necessarily important in this picture is thinking about how social disadvantages operate in different circumstances at different times. So in addition to experiences of discrimination, and I think this is why the case with Keon is also interesting to me, that experiencing forms of social disadvantage and experiencing multiple forms of social disadvantage simultaneously is also going to shape not just what those disadvantages look like, but how one responds to them, including how one navigates institutions like a healthcare system. So to come back to the law, um, out of that early paper, out of the 1989 paper, what prompted that was a case, DeGraff and Reed v. General Motors, 1976, which comes out of St. Louis, interestingly enough, which is where I live now. I, I never noticed that before, uh, I guess because I'd never really thought that much about St. Louis before. Now I notice everything St. Louis related. But the idea was that um, a group of Black women sued, challenging the seniority system and challenging it on the grounds that it discriminated against Black women. And the courts ruled essentially that black women could not think of themselves as a particular separate category and that they would, and I think the um, language that the courts used was that to think of black women as a particular category made them kind of a super category where they get both the benefits of racial discrimination and gender discrimination as though those are benefits, right? So GM, GM's response was, look, we hired, we've hired women for years. So what is your problem, Black woman, with the seniority system? Well, these women, these five women who brought suit said, well, you don't hire, you weren't hiring Black women. And GM was like, well, we've hired Black people. Um, but of course, the issue was they weren't hiring Black women. And, and this was a plant. So Black men were being hired for, you know, to work on the line in various ways. And white women had been hired doing kind of clerical work um, for various ways. But due to the seniority system and you know, those kind of circumscribed ways of hiring, the kind of racialized and gendered ways of hiring Black women were not hired. And so again, just giving, giving you a little background, but what that leads to that I think is really important for our conversation is this idea that intersectionality is not just about identity. It's not just about me feeling a particular kind of way as a result of having kind of multiple intersecting identities, but that intersectionality is inherently an attempt to grapple with social structures and legal structures and in our instance, healthcare structures, right? The fact that this particular kind of um, resistance to conversation, to, to multiple oppression, multiple forms of oppression becomes circumscribed in the law, right? The Graf and Reed and the others who brought suit actually lost, right? They lost. And so by losing, right, the courts kind of reified or reinscribed that, that some forms of discrimination are actually legally okay, right? That's implicitly what's happening. So what do I mean? Again, not solely about identity, 
but thinking about how systems of oppression manifest to shape who we are and how we navigate the world. So knowing that, for instance, I can't bring suit as a black woman, right, under under many circumstances for particular forms of abuse. Right? I mean, it's 2022. There there have been cases since then, but that but that's really important. And that also, right, just kind of showing why a single axis framework is not sufficient to offer proper analyses of structural oppression. Because you miss some stuff, just like these black women who are suing GM for discrimination. You miss some things if you just think about, for instance, gender, or if you just think about, for example, race. It's my time looking at 10.35, okay. Um, Powers and Faden, whose work I actually really appreciate, have this whole book that came out in 2019 on structural injustice. And although they don't talk a lot about intersectionality in that text, in fact, I'm trying to remember, I don't think they talk about it at all. They emphasize, right, they give us a kind of understanding and appreciation for what structural injustice is and what it involves. And here's directly out of Powers and Faden. Social arrangements, including certain institutions and social practices, have highly consequential, differential, and sometimes unjust effects on individuals because they are members of identifiable social groups. And so I want us to kind of keep that in the back of our mind also. I'm giving you a lot of things to hold in the back of your head uh, during this presentation, but I want us to keep that in mind, that social arrangements, including institutions and social practices, that they matter, the institutions we create matter, the social practices in which we engage matter. So how is this relevant to healthcare? Well, um, if we think about intersectionality as a conceptual framework, then we also have to think about how the institutional practices within clinical environments, even those that seem neutral, unfairly advantage some and disadvantage others. And I think this comes out of, I think this, maybe a semi-direct quote or paraphrasing out of the intersectionality paper that I wrote. Right, so we have to think about, right, so among the things we have to think about is, is, is what our institutional practices look like. What are we committing to? What kinds of conversations are we having in the room during ethics consults? And how are these practices that on the face of them don't seem like that big a deal, um, how are they actually advantaging some and disadvantaging others? So I have this example from gynecology. I know this is a peds grand round, but I, I really like this example. And of course, there was a while when I was writing and, and kind of thinking a lot with an OBGYN. So I have a lot of GYN examples just kind of that I can pull off the top of my head pretty easily. Here's an example from, from gynecology though. Um, so that's an IUD. I, I found a good picture of an IUD, right? Um, there's, there's conversation about, of course, um, reliable contraception, access to contraception, of course, family planning, being able to have some control over one's fertility and when one has children or whether and under what circumstances. And the IUD, again, this is one of these things that seems neutral on its face, um, is often thought of as kind of if not ideal, as close to ideal as we have in some circumstances, particularly around among, particularly for young women who, for reasons of education or career or just general emotional and financial and, and developmental stability, um, for whom it's probably a good idea to maybe put off having babies right away. And so there was a, a kind of recommendation several years ago to kind of think about suggesting IUDs to, you know, young, young women as they're, to give them an opportunity to pursue again, education and other kinds of goals. What it turns out is that low SES, black patients and Latina patients were recommended IUDs at, at much higher rates. Right? So if you just think about women as some abstract category, yes, women need to have the opportunity to grow and develop and, and, and put off child rearing. Um, and you don't think about the kind of intersection of race and socioeconomic status with gender. And also to kind of go back to the biases conversation, what biases are present when you think about low SES Black women, low SES Latinas, and, com and biases around assumptions about sexual activity and fertility? Um, then the IUD 
you see the IUD in a different light. You see recommendations for IUDs in a different light. Now, does that mean that we should not recommend IUDs to low SES, you know, black women who are like 20? I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that the, the kind of intersectional, this, this kind of framework, this conceptual framework of intersectionality might lead us to rethink what it means to make these recommendations. And also because we know that kind of biased behavior can have negative impact impacts on people to whom the bias isn't even directed, you see low SES white women aren't getting the opportunity to think about having this kind of um, control over their fertility. And we can talk about this in the, in the Q&A some too. But I, but, I, but I find this example really interesting um, as one who appreciates the miracle that is the IUD. Um, and, you know, on its face without any kind of further critical thinking, thinks that it is a, a, a kind of great recommendation for younger women. What does that look like once you think about the intersection of race and SES um, in addition to these kind of abstract gendered stories. So we want to think about how social categories shape patients, clinicians, and the interactions between patients and clinicians. And so we see that our social identities aren't just kind of what we do as individuals, but how we all interact with one another and how we interact with uh, the institutions that we have to navigate. So to return to the question, can considering a framework of intersectionality provide another ethical perspective? I think it can, uh, depending on, again, as I said at the outset, what your expectation is for this uh, ethical framework, right? So what are some things that we can do in, in kind of thinking about an intersectional approach? Well, confronting one's own biases and assumptions about differences and similarities Asking, right, being really intentional about thinking about how patients experience structural disadvantage through multiple axes of disadvantage, right? Is this person experiencing disadvantage, you know, just along categories of race or race and gender or race and gender and socioeconomic status or around cognitive ability? Uh, you know, I think that these, these are the important questions that we have to ask. And also thinking about to the extent that one has some, some say in control over institutional policies and practices, how is it that the practices that we uphold advantage some and disadvantage others, particularly around um, the ways that these identities impact how one navigates spaces? So I see that my time is kind of drawing near. I want to um, I want to come back to Kiana, and, and, and I was intentional about um, posting or, or finding a, a shot of a child because Kiana is not a child, right? And I think that that's important that he's received care in this pediatric space as a child. And now he is, you know, transitioning into young adulthood. And what does that look like that he still kind of wants to um, continue care in this space that is designated for children and what does that look like in terms of structural injustice? Let's put a pin on that. I'm not going to, I had a whole spiel about that. I'm going to fast forward through that because I'm looking at the time. All right. So another note on structural inju injustice, right? And this comes out of a paper that I have on like assessing patient noncompliance or something like that, that I want us to kind of think about and hold in our heads. That clinicians can avail themselves of their institutions to codify their interpretation of a patient's behavior is one way that our health, health status, and health access are not solely the result of our providers or our own individual efforts. So again, this becomes another space where the kind of structural injustice and the kind of individual identity categories and characteristics collide. And I think that that's important um, to note. So here's some of the questions that I have for for further discussion, and, and, I'm, and I'll just throw some kind of early thoughts about. What does capacity or competence mean under conditions of injustice? I mean, right, we have these kind of clear guidelines for what it means for a patient to be competent, what it means for a patient to have or exhibit capacity. Um, right, being able to make future plans, understanding their diagnosis, et cetera. But are there ways that our assessments of one's ability to, for example, plan for the future or understand one's diagnosis might be filtered through 
these kind of structural injustices that some patients have to navigate in more challenging ways than others. So we think about Keon as for a period of time having a foster family, but essentially being alone in the world, uh, even as even from childhood and having to figure out some things in addition to um, having been diagnosed with some form of uh, intellectual disability. And, and my next couple of questions, which which are connected to one another, how might this desire for continued care, right? How much how might this desire for kind of continued pediatric care into adulthood be a manifestation of disadvantage, right? I mean, it might just be the case that these are the people you're comfortable with and you just want to stick with your care team. But it also might be, right, if you are navigating and trying to make your way through as many different things as Keon is, maybe you need this continuity. Right, the fact that he doesn't seem to have a lot of other resources to draw on and that now the care team and the ethics consult team are being tasked with trying to figure this out for him so that they can do their jobs. Um, I think is itself a, a manifestation of disadvantage that maybe we need to talk about and think about in these in these pediatric spaces. And if it is the case that at least in some instances, we know people might have lots of reasons for wanting to continue with. Uh, pediatric care, particularly people with chronic illness. Um, but if it is a manifestation of disadvantage, right? If at least in some instances we, we see this kind of relationship with disadvantage, then what does that mean for pediatrics, right? Does that then impose other kinds of obligations on people who work in the pediatric space? And I guess the closest analogy I could think of when I was thinking about this was how emergency departments are taxed. Because rather than just being sites of emergent care, they end up being these spaces where people who don't have insurance and, um, it, it, you know, go to seek primary care or urgent care, you know, on top of these tasks. And so, you know, you end up with this system that's kind of, that's very stretched while trying to accommodate people that it, that it, that don't have anywhere else to go. And, and then the final question that I want us to kind of think about is how might understanding intersectionality just prompt different questions, right? Rather than thinking about like non-compliance and non-adherence is just a kind of tisk 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 on the patient, which it's very clear that this team isn't doing. But what are what are the kind of different questions that we might ask? And and I'm throwing that on to you. Uh, some of you probably came here expecting me to give you the answer to that question, but that's a question that I want us to kind of end with and ponder. So thank you so much for your time and attention. And uh, I think that we're we're ready to chat a little bit. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. I'm I'm I'll, I'll share at least for myself. I'm still digesting, but that was that was wonderful. And uh, as a reminder, again, please uh, do put comments or questions into the chat, uh, and and I hope we we can have a discussion. Um, while I'm while I'm waiting, I, I I wonder actually while I'm trying to think through your questions if I could ask you another one, um, Dr. Wilson, just as as a way of of kicking us off. I appreciated the 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 comments you made that when when thinking about a, a concept like intersectionality and identities, I, I love the analogy of of colors that that identities are not additive and in fact can can lead to other things. There's there's kind of a tension that I think can occur though when we when we start to think about identities of continuing to refine finer and finer and finer uh, as as we think about different ideas. And I, I wonder if as we we try and be thoughtful about our patients, their experiences, and also the identities that we bring uh, to clinical encounters, um, how how you might think about that. Yeah. So you know it's funny. Um... It's funny that you that you say that. Um, that's something that I've I've struggled with thinking about, right? Are, are we just trying to kind of distill down into the you know now we've got thirty seven different categories of some person that we need to think about and 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 understand? And I I don't think I don't think that's necessarily what's required. And I think Crenshaw herself has said this. Um, there's this really interesting YouTube clip, and I wish I could remember which one it is, where she talks about how people just approach her on the street and they're like, I came up with a new, you know, collection of categories for, for people. And I think, you know, why I wanted to spend so much time paying attention to this structural side and this 
how one navigates institutions aspect is because I think that that aspect gets lost in in these conversations about kind of counting identities or distilling down into fine and finer and finer grained identities. Well, I think the identity piece is certainly important and it's going to affect how one navigates structures. I think that kind of the broader upshot is that taking seriously identity is what's going to allow you to rethink how it is that people navigate our institutions and structures. Thank you. I I wonder I'm I'm still trying to think through the 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 idea of of the desire to remain in pediatric care which is is something that that many of us in the audience have certainly have, have experienced um, as as a manifestation in some ways of of disadvantage because uh, often I'll, I'll share at least personally we often think about it as the opposite that it is it's in some ways a, a reflection uh, if not of a failure of of us as pediatricians uh, of of not placing a, a now a young adult in a position where they do feel that they have the the tools necessary to be successful. Uh, seeking adult medical care uh, and and taking on a greater role of of, of their own medical care, um, and I'm wondering how to fit those two together, the, those two concepts. And maybe maybe it, uh, I'll stop there and, and see if, if, if you have comments. Yeah. So again, I'm not suggesting that every instance of wanting to continue pediatric care as an adult is is a manifestation of disadvantage. I guess what I'm thinking, what I have in mind is, you know, since since this is the case that's on the table, um, someone like Kiana who may not have a ton of other options, who who at least based on how how the case is described, how how his life is described in the case doesn't have a ton of options, right? This isn't about a kind of failure to launch scenario. This is about this young man is sleeping on people's couches. He is experiencing possibly um, maybe just fatigue with being sick, right? You know, sick of being sick, right? I don't feel up to this treatment today. I just don't want to, right? So, there, so there's a lot happening that he is having to manage just as a human. And that perhaps, um, Given that he has, that he began care in this particular space as a child, this may be the, the kind of space of continuity for him, all right? This becomes a space of safety, of continuity, of um, I realize that people will take me seriously as actually being sick and not drug seeking because these people know me, right? That becomes a, a thing, a very real thing. Right, I don't have to go show up and 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 do a whole story of who I am, and you know, get people to trust that I'm actually sick, or you know, I'm with people who are willing to try to help. Right, even if I don't always accept that. I mean, the other part of that is he's 18, right? So y'all know this better than I do. Developmentally, I'm sure some of this may be just kind of wanting to assert autonomy or rebelling or whatever. But 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 that when I say, oh, I don't feel up to it today. And that may mean he doesn't feel up to it today. It may mean he's just kind of asserting his autonomy. It may mean he's sick of being sick. It may, right? It may mean any number of things, but having had kind of years of care in that space means that people know him well enough to like try. And I think when one is kind of juggling as many things as he's juggling, the idea that someone is in your corner willing to try matters. And I think that it, it, it again, becomes this kind of, it, I, I think it can magnify the other kinds of ways that this young man has been failed in his life. Thanks for that. So, yeah, um, there, I'll, there's I'll, potentially a tension there. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, a question came in uh, from, from uh, Dr. Jennifer Kett, um, really asking you to reflect on, on and the considerations of guardianship that came up in the case and how we can think about seeking legal guardianship or, or adult protective services involvement in, in the case of, of, of this patient um, when thinking of, of intersectionality or, or when thinking as, uh, 
as a potentially oppressive or supportive um, effort for the patient. Yeah, I, I'm curious what the patient thinks about, you know, a, a kind of pursuing guardianship at 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 his age. Um, I would be really curious to hear that. Um, we also know, right, we have these tensions in bioethics about respect for autonomy. And I think, you know, paternalism is thought of as, as a bad thing, at least on the face of it is a bad thing, unless we can make some kind of overriding case for why why one needs certain kinds of paternalistic interventions. But I am kind of, I tend to be cautious, particularly around kind of race and SES and cognitive ability of the assumption that people can't manage their lives because there's a long history of those kinds of assumptions about black people. Um, and I, and I think that maybe kind of jumping to a guardian, absent further conversation about how he understands his life and what and and how he understands what a guardian might do in light of the goals that he's expressed, right? How a guardian might help that. Um, I would I would be leery of just kind of jumping to that. I mean, I think that that gives us a different way to to also think. Like, are we just assuming that this guy? can't manage his life because he's making different decisions than than many of us in the room would make. Um, but we're also have very different kind of current situated life experiences than this person makes. And maybe if we think about it from that lens, some of his, at least some of his decisions may be more reasonable than at first blush. I'm not saying one way or another, I'm just raising that mm -hmm. as a possibility. I think I'll, I'll take advantage of, of getting to be the moderator to ask you a question that's been on my mind. Um, in, in your paper and in your remarks, um, you, you comment that, that intersectionality is, is concerned with, with... And now, the light for writing the beautiful... Oh, wait, I missed some of that. I'll start over. Um, in, in your paper and in your remarks, you, you note that intersectionality is, is something that can be considered how the intersection of, of, of identities at the macro, the national, international level, the, the meso, the regional level, or, or at, at local, either a community or in an individual, uh, uh, within an individual or an individual encounter level. I wonder what to, how you would think about that on an organizational level. I share that as, as we uh, we hear it at our organization have declared health equity to be one of our core values and have have publicly committed to becoming an anti racist organization. How does how does a concept like this or, or, or a framework of intersectionality? How could, do you do you have thoughts about how that could be applied at an organizational level? Yeah, you know, this and the and the kind of clinical question are, are the questions that I always struggle with and that I always hope nobody asks me. Like, just let me do theory. And <laughs> because, you know, I I you know, I, I sympathize with people who go, okay, well, what do we do? Right. And and that's something that that I struggle with, right? I mean, it's one thing to kind of talk about theory. But what do we do when we're at Seattle Children's Hospital and we have to make real time decisions about people while thinking about hospital policy and thinking about what the feds demand in turn for hospitals and um, how can one uphold that commitment or those commitments? And, you know, the, the best answer I have right now is I'm still kind of thinking through what that looks like um, organizationally beyond giving these opportunities to think about a reshaping conversation, right? I mean, I think that's a first step, but that can't be the only step. And maybe if we can get on board with having the conversation, I think I said at the very beginning that in some spaces I've been in, people are very resistant to even the idea of bias. Um, And unfortunately, that we're we're nearing time, and and several great questions just came in, but I, I I do think that we need to 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 bring things to a close this morning. I also want to uh, 
briefly be selfish and claim the last minute uh, to share two things with our, our broader audience. One is a reminder um, that the Clinical Ethics Consultation Service has been in, engaged in focusing on consults related to issues of health equity. This is done in partnership uh, with CDHE, particularly uh, by, with my colleague, Maya Scott. Uh, and so for clinical concerns that do come up, please do reach out to us. And the second is a reminder that uh, to be on the lookout for our 17th annual uh, Summer Bioethics Conference, July 15th, 16th at the Bell Harbor Convention Center. Our topic for this year is breakthroughs in pediatrics, past lessons, present controversies, and future challenges. And now I will step off my soapbox, but again, uh, very much, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Wilson for, for sharing her expertise with us this morning and, and really giving us a lot to think about uh, and a lot to learn from. So thank you again, thank Dr. You Wilson. Thank you again for having me. Thank you again for having me. This was great. I, I hope that you all found at least some of it useful. Thank you so much, everyone. That was very useful and gave us a lot to think about. And for our audience, thanks for being here and we'll see you all next week.